uh, the elliptical narrative was that a conscious choice? Did you did you start off wanting to tell the story that way? Um, yeah, the structure evolved in editing a little bit, but um, uh, it was about sort of moving the timelines around were about thematic connections, what was going on with the character and his drives or what was fueling him to make his decisions, both um, oh, the way I see the movie it was the same thing uh, in both vastly dif different circumstances that was making him uh, make the choices he was. So one thing in regard to character development is kind of fascinating how <laughs> he comes full circle in the course of the story because in a way, uh, it's a morality tale, but the insurance company always wins. <laughs> it's, it's a little dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little dark and, yeah, a little cynical in its point of view. But um, y when you talk about, actually, this film, I, I know that it, that it played in Montreal, and it was uh, the world premiere happened in Shanghai, mm -hmm. the Shanghai International Film Festival. So it's uh, seen some ground and travel quite a bit already. Um, just given that it is an elliptical narrative, what's the reaction been like from crowds? <clears throat> um, yeah, it, the world premiere was in China, and I was told, I don't know if this is a generalization, but um, sometimes Asian audiences like that sort of structure, puzzle film. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there were full houses there, and they seemed to get into it. So. <laughs> I thought it was a bit of a language barrier, but they seemed to, <laughs> they seemed to like it. So. Were there subtitles? Sort of. Yeah, yeah, they were yeah. <laughs> screened in the film. Um, a, a great story. I just, I'm going to toss it out to you to ask Ross questions um, because I know after seeing a film like that, you'll probably have some burning questions. Um, uh, among other things, it seemed like such a great collaborative effort on so many levels. You had some uh, remarkable talent in the film on screen. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of those actors, I think of Catherine Isabel, for example, right, I've right. seen fairly often. Um, how did you lay down the casting once you had the bones of the story together? Uh, so we were very, very low budget. It might look in places a little more expensive than it actually was. But uh, So we got a, a, a casting director by the name of Candace Elzinga, mm -hmm. uh, got behind the script early, and, and she was able to find uh, quite a, a solid and amazing cast, actually. Um, without that, I think it'd be a different film. Though the performances being pretty, pretty strong, and the uh, crew were people that uh, were trained crew in Vancouver, but everyone was working, you know, a notch or two higher than they normally would. And so we just tried to find talented people that uh, wanted to be there for the project. And no one really got paid very much, but uh, uh, we owe them a huge thanks. Well, I have to say, the film looks incredibly beautiful. Uh, uh, I love the story. I found it ultimately compelling to the very end because in so many cases where it is it's an elliptical narrative and I think of the films of David Lynch, for example, you're wondering, okay, what, how is this going to play out in the end? So uh, I found it spellbinding on that level, but it was also remarkably beautiful, just oh, uh, the way it looked. So when you sort of suggest that it was shot on a shoestring budget, I'm, Absolutely shocked at that because it looks remarkable. Sorry about the sound, by the way. The, the, the um, surround sound actually wasn't working, or it was uh, probably quite quiet in the front. And we got them to turn it up a little bit, but I, I don't think it was actually firing in five. Oh, okay. But I heard Ave Maria loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> um, and Ave Maria, what a great, uh, what a great piece of music to open up the film, punctuating kind of an an irony, as yeah. it were. And I think of some filmmakers, Wong Kar Wai uses that device, um, some Asian filmmakers. Um, again, I'd like to turn it out over to you in the audience, and just maybe if you can put up your hand or, or yell in, don't be shy by all means. Yeah, right in the middle there in the back. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Did everybody hear that? The first question? The symbology of the turtles? Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, 
Yeah, well, uh, Andrea, the Andrea character, is uh, it's left a little open-ended um, as far as what the detectives will do, but um, it doesn't look good for her, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, um, so is one of the turtles aptly named Andrea yeah. in the film? I know that her <laughs> actual name was Lorne or something. <laughs> the turtle, yeah. that is. <laughs> um, so the turtles was just a visual sort of system I, I was interested in. It, it, it kind of echoes... Visually, uh, Nicholas's journey. He early in the film, he, despite him being flawed, or like we all are, he uh, is still able to flip the turtle over, reach out, and sort of um, what's the word uh, to help uh, to help another thing outside of himself. Um, and uh, when Harry lives in the apartment, sort of off screen, when he lives in the condo, one of the turtles dies, and then at the end. Nicholas has sort of, in a way, lost his ability to want to go and help the turtle or uh, reach out to something outside of himself. And just, for me, it was sort of uh, reflecting the loss of morality or the change in him. Another question out there? Go ahead. Don't be shy. <laughs> the floor is open. Yes? Did everybody hear that question? Uh, from a writer's point of view, and there are so many choices coming at you in terms of perceptions and ideas, uh, how do you choose which one you want to roll with to make a feature film? Is that kind of, is that it in a nutshell? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's like, how do you know when a painting's finished? Or I'm not sure. It's... Uh, um, I know, it, I know it evolved a lot. It, it was different than the, sh the script that we shot. It changed in editing, and it, its uh, scripts are, they say, a blueprint, and then there are, are a draft of the story, and the next draft is when you shoot it, and the final draft is when you edit it together. Um, so it's always evolving, but when is it ready to shoot? Um, I guess when it's day one of <laughs> principal photography. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess uh, I wish I had a better answer for that. Yeah. Were there, to that end, were there sweeping changes that happened from the script, the draft of the script, and the final cut? Was there anything significant that changed in terms of the plot? Yeah, well, we did not, didn't have the re, uh, <clears throat> the budget to reshoot anything except very small things, pickups. But um, uh, there was more the uh, the future timeline was quite a bit different. And uh, I found that it was people needed a little more time to get into the story mm. uh, than at the script level, which um, it was intercut more up front in the first 20 minutes, and we kind of made it a little more linear up front. We self-financed this film, which meant it was a hard road to go, but it also meant uh, complete freedom. So we didn't have Lionsgate or someone saying, no, you can't do this or you can't do that. And... Uh, if I'm able to make another film, I'm sure I'll never have quite that freedom again. But it's an expensive uh, art form. It's um, unfortunately, it's uh, uh, it, to make a film is usually millions of dollars, and and some that's money comes from somewhere, and they want a return on the investment, which usually means you're trying to push a plot or, uh, or push something that's uh, uh, more mainstream or someone imposing that on, on the script. It's a um, bit of a paradox because in some ways when you shake hands, when you go to the crossroads and shake hands with the devil, as it were, you, you become like a publicly traded company in so many respects, I suppose, because making a film is an art form, but it's a collaborative art form on so many levels. And it's uh, you hear filmmakers even, you know, the... People like Steven Soderbergh saying that it's such a rare thing to have any freedom to do what I want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great luxury. Would you go down the road of self-financing again? I mean, it sounds arduous. <laughs> it's very, ar yeah. it's very arduous. Um, you know, part of the reason you go down that road is because you have no track record to to um, show that you can make a film or tell a story. Um, so it's. It's not 100% your, your choice. It's, it's something that's... Uh, but uh, as you move along, I, as you were speaking, I was thinking of the Martin Scorsese quote where he says he makes 
one for me and one for them. Yeah. So he'll go back and forth, and he'll make a personal movie, and then he'll make something for Hollywood, and it keeps him relevant. And um, um, yeah. And it's rare. It's a rare thing when when a film can satisfy two masters and be hugely underwritten, for example, by Hollywood, but still be a work of great beauty and interest, like the story we just saw. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't really set it in Vancouver uh, as a story. Um, it's not really, the city's not really referenced. It's, uh, it's the idea of a city. Um, uh, and actually, I tried to keep sort of, uh, the exteriors, except for maybe one or two, keep them a little more gritty, so it's down by the warehouses instead of Falls Creek or the mountains. It's it's a little more claustrophobic and a little more um, dangerous feeling, I guess. And, mm -hmm. uh, Vancouver's pretty city in places, and um, we wanted to keep that out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Just raise your hand in the back, the very back row there. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that was it's. Uh, it was something I found along the way. It wasn't uh, a set starting point. Um, I started was learning, trying to learn how to write, and I was coming up with different structures. And um, strangely, uh, now, um, like first draft was written a while ago, and strangely, since then, life kind of caught up with it a little bit. Um, thinking of the uh, insurance. Uh, debate in the United States about universal health care and sort of the moral issue of extending that or not extending that and and the one percent and you know controlling quite a bit of the wealth on the planet and um, that was certainly something I was thinking about and it's sort of that argument kind of blossomed most more in the, in the United States um, but it started to feel a little more relevant to me closer to the time we shot this moralistic vigilanteism, you could call it, I suppose. <laughs> um, other questions? Out there? By all means, right in the middle there. Yes, sir. Yeah, they supported the script at, uh, at the um, development stage. So I think it was one or two drafts. They gave us money at that stage. And then we didn't apply after that. We just went ahead and shot the film. So, yeah, thanks to Telefilm Canada for their support early on. Yeah. yeah. We certainly hope to. We have some interest uh, as a company in the States and another one in Canada. And um, Traditionally, with these type of films, you try to play festivals and you try to garner as much positive, as many positive things as you can. And that sort of helps you then package that and take that to a distributor and um, if you don't get a full theatrical release you can usually get a digital release these days so that's something we hope to do um, we're probably going to take the film down to the American film market in uh, November I can imagine it playing very well in a venue like that yes and so there's something like 10,000 films down there so. yeah right right <laughs> I'm not sure a little bit of competition <laughs> other questions out there um, don't be shy in the dwindling moments they're being winnowed away here any other questions uh, no I haven't actually no and they were all fantastic to work with um, they certainly could have made uh, we were paying them much below their regular <laughs> scale they're not they're not star actors but they certainly are working actors and and um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about them, and I'll certainly work with them again. <coughs> uh, and so you were talking about writing a draft and rewriting this film, and the, uh, that Truffaut thing about three films ostensibly happened through writing and, and shooting and editing. Um, so when you walked into this, how much experience did you have making films? Did you have a fairly lengthy track record? Um, I I'd, I'd I'd directed shorts. Went to film school, directed shorts. Um, I'd worked in editing rooms on other independent features, mm -hmm. which was a great place to sort of see how the film was shot, how it was came together, the problems that, that had to be solved. And um, 
and I'd worked as a writer on a, there's a film that got produced called The Delicate Art of Parking a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. And, uh, that's a great film. And a few other things that are in development hell. But. <laughs> wow, that's an astounding bit of writing, I have to say, for um, somebody that doesn't have a huge track record. Um, so uh, what happens now? You sit with this film for a while, but you also mentioned that there are other things going on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to sell this film, um, have a script and a half <laughs> out mm-hmm. there, and I'm reading a couple other scripts. And it's, um, it's a bit of a one-man band right now. <laughs> People have to go off and work. So um, as soon as we can get this pass this off to distributor, I'll be free of it. It's been a long time. And mm-hmm. move on to the, the next uh, project. Yeah, next project. Yeah. So I'd like to uh, applaud you for doing some magnificent work. Mm-hmm.